Hello, my name is Tim Schmidt. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin Madison. I'm a myeloma researcher, and I am happy to summarize the results of my abstract looking at the impact of chromosome one abnormalities that we saw in a subgroup analysis of the ECOG E1A11 or endurance trial. So chromosome one abnormalities are some of the most commonly identified cytogenetic abnormalities in multiple myeloma. And both gain of one Q and loss of one P uh, are, have been associated with poor outcomes, but it's complicated. Uh, because these are often also identified within the context of other high-risk abnormalities. And it's somewhat debated whether or not these confer a poor prognosis in and of themselves and whether or not it impacts management. We also sought to look at the impact of copy number because uh, higher numbers of chromosome 1Q often correlates with worse outcomes than gain of only one extra copy, and we also wanted to take a look to see if the choice of proteasome inhibitor, specifically carfilzomib or bortezomib, was superior in either of these uh, populations of patients with chromosome one abnormalities. So we took a look at the endurance trial, uh, which was uniquely suited to answer this question. The reason for that is that the endurance trial, or E1A11, was a large randomized controlled trial that primarily evaluated patients with otherwise standard risk myeloma. There were no other high-risk cytogenetic abnormalities, with the exception of translocation 414 included in this study. And it specifically excluded a lot of patients uh, with high-risk uh, markers, such as very high LDH. This study randomized patients to receive lenalidomide and dexamethasone with either bortezomib or carfilzomib as a part of the first randomization, with a primary endpoint of progression-free survival, time till the disease progresses. What we did was we went back uh, and uh, took a look at patients' individual FISH reports to determine the presence or absence of uh, plus 1Q or deletion 1P, which are defined here on the slide. And what we found was that approximately a third of patients enrolled in this study who were tested for plus 1Q had an abnormality. About three quarters of those had gain of 1Q or just one extra copy of the long arm of chromosome 1 and the remaining 25% had amplification or more than that. And on the contrary, approximately 9% of patients had deletion of 1P. The patients with these abnormalities were well balanced between the two treatment arms, plus 1Q tended to be associated with some higher risk features, particularly the presence of translocation 414, which is considered to be a high risk cytogenetic abnormality, each were associated with uh, higher rates of ISS stage three or more advanced uh, clinical stage. Uh, and uh, neither, uh, actually both seem to be inversely related with the presence of translocation 1114, which is a unique marker as well. What we found in this study was that patients with plus one Q uh, in general had of course progression-free survival than those who did not. Uh, and importantly, this was almost entirely patients made up of the hyperdiploid subset, uh, which has been debated whether or not this abnormality is significant in these patients. When we broke it down by copy number, we saw that with increasing copies of chromosome 1Q, the outcomes were worse uh, than with just one extra copy or with no abnormal 1Q probes. It did appear that PFS uh, was worse for patients with plus 1Q, regardless of which treatment arm they were on, uh, but it seems that the outcomes were stratified more in the carfilzomib group than the bortezomib group. But this is something that we'll see among all of the subgroup analyses, and I think it's a little bit complicated here as we get into smaller numbers uh, in those subsets. Overall survival, we took a look at that. And once again, it showed that plus 1Q had inferior overall survival compared to patients with normal 1Q, and that also was stratified by copy number. The impact of treatment arm did seem to have quite different results uh, for the VRD and the KRD arms. The reasons for that are unknown at this point, particularly because it seemed like the inverse was true for amplification 1Q regarding uh, whether VRD or KRD was better as opposed to the gain 1Q patients. 
Similarly, deletion of 1P had inferior outcomes, including progression-free and overall survival. And once again, there was a difference in the treatment arms. The reasons for this remain unknown. On multivariate analysis, plus 1Q was significantly associated with worse progression-free survival. Uh, and regarding overall survival, it actually seemed like deletion 1P was worse. I think what's important here is that our multivariate analysis really could not uh, identify subsequent treatments, which are really important for uh, determining the impact of these things on overall survival. But for PFS, which was pretty much well controlled for, it seemed like plus one Q was strongly associated with forced progression-free survival. We looked at some other high-risk subsets here. And again, there was no difference between the two treatment arms for any of these potential high-risk subsets. In an overall survival, it did appear that perhaps those with gain 1Q, deletion 1P, or two or more high-risk abnormalities as defined by this ultra-high-risk group may have benefited uh, from KRD. But once again, the details regarding why overall survival would be better when there's no difference in PFS is unclear uh, as uh, there are a lot of confounding factors there. So in conclusion, what we found was that gain of 1Q, uh, whether it's one extra copy or four or more copies, as well as deletion 1P, these were adverse cytogenetic uh, abnormalities and really should be considered as high risk uh, cytogenetic abnormalities for patients with otherwise standard risk disease who are not undergoing upfront autologous stem cell transplants. Uh, I would urge caution in determining the relative benefit of proteasome inhibitor uh, within this, the context of this study, once again, because we don't know about the subsequent therapies and we just need to investigate this further. Overall, what I would say is for patients with gain or amplification of 1Q or deletion 1P, I would strongly consider uh, attempting to take these patients for an upfront autologous stem cell transplant, which does seem to have benefited patients with gain 1Q and AMP 1Q in uh, other studies such as the FORTE trial, um, or alternatively strongly consider uh, enrolling these patients in clinical trials so that we can learn how best to treat patients with chromosome one abnormalities, in particular clinical trials that are looking at novel strategies to improve outcomes in high-risk patients. Thank you.